What a beautiful time worshiping Jesus. You may be seated. And it is so good to see you all. Welcome to our second Sunday, third of the year, but second at ICB. And it is so good to have so many of you back today, if you've been gone for the holidays, et cetera. And it's so good as well to welcome many of you to the church family. These are months of receiving new students, new families, new friends, and we're so grateful that you're here. I want to acknowledge we have two special guests with us as well today. Our area directors, meaning our direct oversight, are visiting with us, and that is Joe and Noemi Zabo. Would you stand to your feet? We're so grateful for them. Yes. They are such a blessing. They are a pastor of pastors, and it's just so wonderful. When I was going through everything I went through over the last couple of years, she was like the Lord, man. She is like omnipresent. She was like right there with me the whole time, and Joe's been such a blessing, so thank you. If you are new to the family, great day to be here because you're going to learn about something that we do every year. If you've been a part of the church family for some time, you know that we start every year the same way. That is very much on purpose. The first thing that we do is our first Sunday gathering. We come together for a New Year's message, usually delivered by John. It's a message of vision, and it's a word that God's given us for this year. That was last Sunday. The word that the Lord gave us as a family and for this church and all of the campuses as well is forward, hacia adelante, forward. If you were not here last week, I need to encourage you to go to the app and look at that message because it's so important to who we are and to what the Lord wants to do this year in our church family. He spoke about the Hebrew word kadima. Kadima means forward, but it also means to remember. The same word means forward as remember, because as we remember Christ, as we remember his goodness, his faithfulness, his safe passage to us, we can look forward with anticipation, with faith, with confidence. Amen? He said that we need to remember. We need to reset. And the third point, makes me nervous, was we need to risk. Woo! We need to take that step of faith and be willing to trust God for new things this year. Amen? So go back and listen. The second thing we do every year is we start with prayer and fasting. We consecrate ourselves to the Lord as a people and as a church. So that will begin next week, not this Monday, next Monday on the 23rd. You'll be hearing more about that. We'll have opportunities to pray together in the mornings, some evenings. You'll have a prayer journal that is digitally available to you so we can all be praying for the same things. Of course, you'll add on your prayer requests as well. But we want to really give these two weeks to the Lord, and it's a beautiful start every year. If you've been a part of it, you know. It's awesome. The third thing thing that we do every single year, and it starts today, is we teach our core values. We teach who we are as a church. If you're new, this is a great way to know what you're a part of. And I guess if you want to be a part of it, (laughs) if you're part of the church family, you know this is a recentering time for us all. We come back to why we exist, who we are, what decisions we make, and why. And along with our vision and mission, our core values are what keep us on track. A core value is a guiding principle. It's a fundamental belief. It's a foundation. It's a center. It's a nucleus. That's what a core value is. It's, again, what keeps us on track. It's how we know we're headed in the right direction. And here at ICB, we have three core values. If you've been a part of the church for some time, you should know them. This is a pop quiz. Yes, it is. We're going to say them together. Our first core value is that we are Christ-centered. Well done. Woo! Our second core value, we are relationally connected. And our third core value is that we are outward focused. You will hear us talk about these all the time. Every week, there should be some mention of being Christ-centered, relationally connected, and outward focused because it's who we are. So today, we're going to talk about being Christ-centered. Now, this is our ninth year teaching this series. Yes, we're getting old. It's true. (laughs) Well, I'm happy to be. But... It's our ninth year. And every year we take a bit of a different uh, take on this. The same overall content, but a different perspective. And in the early years, we talked a lot about a Christ-centered church. We always make room for one more. Yes, we do. We're life-giving because Christ was life-giving. We still stand by those things. But the last few years, we just sensed we need to talk about a Christ-centered life. 
not just a Christ in our church. Why? Because we are the church. The church is not Orgel 133 or Montanay 157. In Jesus' name, it will be soon. Whew, that felt good. Sorry, I keep yelling, but I'm just excited about it. But, but, but that's not. No, the church is you. The church is me. We are the church. So as we live Christ-centered lives, as we have Christ-centered families and Christ-centered groups, Christ-centered staff, the church will become more and more Christ-centered. Amen? So let's talk about how to live a Christ-centered life. How to make that our foundation, our nucleus, our center that everything else comes from. And the three things we'll talk about today regarding a Christ-centered life and church. First is this, that our relationship with Christ is primary. Our relationship with Christ is primary. The second thing is this, as Christ is primary, the rest can become peripheral. The rest can be peripheral. And the third is this, he's not looking for perfection. It's all about progress. It's all about progress. So Lord, we come before you right now. We ask that you would have your way in this place. We ask you to open our ears, to open our hearts. We choose to focus our attention on you, on your word. And I ask that you would just do something new in each one of our hearts, that you would encourage us to be more like you, that you would encourage us to dedicate ourselves more to you, that you would be the center of it all. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you're not taking notes, start taking notes now. You don't want to miss a thing. So here we go. Our relationship with Christ is primary. What does it mean when something is primary? It is of chief importance. It is principle. It is first. It is the main. It's the highest. It is dominant. When I think of the word primary, the first thing I think of are the primary colors. Did anybody else have that same thought, primary colors? Now, there are infinite numbers, sorry, not numbers, colors on the spectrum. There are so many colors. There's an infinite number of combinations, right? And we have words for some of them, um, maybe like turquoise or fuchsia or seafoam or whatever your color is. But there's some that are, we don't even really have words for them, but we know what it looks like, Right? So like I was talking to a friend this week, last week actually, and she said, I got this dress. And I was like, oh, what color is it? She said, well, it's like an eggplant or a Merlot. I'm like, so it's purple. (laughs) Well, no, it's not purple. It's somewhere between an eggplant and a Merlot. Okay. She couldn't even describe the exact color because there's so many. But all of the colors, though they are infinite in number, come out of three primary colors. You know what they are. They are red, they are blue, they are yellow. And every other variation, every other relationship and combination comes out of those three colors. It is exactly the same with Christ. When he is our primary relationship, everything else flows out of that. There will be infinite relationships and combinations and things in your life and all these things around you. But that is the primary thing that everything else can flow out of. Our relationship with Christ can be primary. Then it's not me anymore. It's Jesus in me. It's not you anymore. It's Jesus in you. That's why scripture says, it's not I who lives anymore. It's Christ who lives in me. And he has become the primary relationship that everything flows out of. It's the lens that we see through, the filter that we process with, the source that we depend on. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, it says, love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second one is like it. You know what it is. Love your neighbor as yourself. But it's interesting that the first has to come before the second. The Bible says, if you love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, then you'll be able to love others. We have tried for so long to love others. Have you? In your own strength, in your own power, in your own ability, it is exhausting. But when our primary relationship is intact, he gives us the love. He gives us the power to forgive. He gives us the ability to behave. He's the one, the source, the fountain, the wind behind all of the rest. Matthew 6 says, seek ye first the kingdom of God 
and all the rest will be added unto you. What's Matthew saying here? If you get that relationship right, all the rest can be added unto you. What an awesome promise. John and I read a book a few years ago, many years ago actually, about parenting. And it was before we became parents, which is the best time to read a book about parenting, by the way, because when you're in it, it, yeah, <laughs> you're in it. So, so prepare yourself as much as you can. Um, and, and we read a book, and it shaped the way, that we, um, the way that we formed our family. It really did. The first chapter was about how children receive their identity and how children um, understand their security and their safety. And, and it said that children need to know that they're loved, to which I was like, yeah, of course, children need to know that they are loved. But what shocked me as I went into chapter two of this book, and this formed so much of our perspective on family, was the research showed that even more than a child knowing that they are loved, the greatest source of security and identity for the child is to know that their parents love each other. I'm going to say that again because this hurts some and this helps some and it's, it's all of it at once even more than a child knowing they are loved. The greatest source of security for the child is to know that their parents love each other. Yes, the child needs to know they're loved, but they know they're gonna be okay when they know their parents love each other. So this shapes some things. We built our family on that concept that if we're good, they're good. (laughs) If we're strong, they're gonna be strong. We are the home team and they're welcome onto the team. Does that make sense? I remember John even saying to each one of our newborns multiple times, welcome. (laughs) He said, we're glad you're here. Now that woman and I have a really good thing going and you're not going to mess it up. So welcome to the team. (laughs) He would say that to our children. Welcome to the team. But it's true. We established a date night before we established a family night. Now I'll be honest with you. Our family nights have come and gone over the seasons. Sometimes they're strong and faithful. Sometimes they're not. Our date night is unmovable. Why? Because that is the primary relationship under our roof that will sustain all of the other relationships under our roof. Does that make sense? Exactly the same with Christ. Here we are trying to be kind, trying to love others, trying to behave ourselves, trying to overcome sin, trying to do all of these things. And Jesus is saying, you can't do that on your own. But if you establish a primary relationship with me, every other relationship will benefit. Every other relationship gets stronger. You're able to live a godly life. You're able to overcome sin. You're able to love and forgive and show grace and mercy because he is the primary relationship, the giver of life that flows into everything else. Amen? Jesus is our primary relationship. The second is this. In a Christ-centered life, as he is our primary relationship, then the rest can become peripheral. What do I mean by that? The rest can become peripheral. Years ago, I was really struggling in my faith. Now, that is no surprise to many of you who know me well, but uh, faith is a recent gift of mine. Praise Jesus. We're all growing here. But I was in the middle of a full-blown faith crisis. Yes, we were on the mission field, and we went to one of our mission meetings that these guys are probably at. Actually, this was many years ago. And the speaker that year was Alicia Britt Scholey. Dr. Alicia Britt-Scholey, who is a mentor to Ruthie. She's a mentor to me. And ladies, she's just confirmed she will be one of our speakers at Real 2023. Whoop, whoop. Yes, I know. Very exciting. But I had not met her officially. And the first thing she says at this retreat, she said, this powerhouse of a woman, she said, I'm so happy to be here with you all. She said, "Um, I've just come out of a faith crisis. I go through them every three or four years, but the Lord's really given me a word to share with you. (gasps) I found my person. (laughs) I get it. She's amazing. Used of the Lord was struggling with her faith. So I called her the next day. I said, can we please meet? She said, yes. I said, I've got this issue. It's big. 
It's this mountain before me, and I don't know how to get past it, and it's causing doubt, and it's causing unbelief. I said, I don't know what to do. She said, tell me about it. I did. When I finished sharing with her about my monumental issue, I was fully expecting her to fix it. (laughs) Tell me, oh, wise one, what to do. Do you think she fixed it? No. She gave me a gift that has been the gift that keeps on giving in so many circumstances since that time. She said, Brandy, that's big. I said, it is. She said, Brandy, it seems like that's become your focus. I said, it has. She said, this is determining how you look at God, how you look at others, how you look at yourself. I said, yes, it is. She said, what if instead of fixing that problem right now, you put that problem to the peripheral vision? I said, I don't know how to do that. (laughs) She said, you take what's become your center focus, you put it to the peripheral. She said, that way you're not ignoring it. Denial helps no one. You're not pretending it's not there. It's very much there, but it's not the center of your focus. I said, so I just stare at it sideways? And she said, no, Brandy, you stare straight at Jesus. (laughs) I've given many of you that advice, have I not? That is the words of a wise mentor, but it's the word and a command straight from Scripture in Hebrews where it says, fix your eyes on Jesus. He is the author, the finisher of your faith. It says to throw off everything that hinders, to throw off the sin that so easily entangles and run the race. The only way to throw off the sin that entangles, the only way to throw off the things that hinder, it's not because they're not there. There's always going to be something there. It's because it's not the center of our focus. It can be the peripheral, and we can fix our eyes on Jesus. Amen? Maybe you're facing something today, and it's taken your focus. Maybe it's a situation, a frustration, an offense, a relationship. I have no idea. Maybe it's a doubt. And you've been looking at that so intently. And the Lord might encourage you today. I'm primary in your life. So that's not to be ignored or denied. But let's move it to the side and put your eyes straight back on me. Straight back on him. To fix your eyes is to look steadily. It's to sustain your focus. There will always be something there, but we can move it to the peripheral and turn our eyes. Rochelle, would you come up? I I normally just burst into song and you sing along with me and you're so patient with my terrible voice. But you know what? We're going to have Rochelle come up and she's going to sing with us. Turn your eyes. By the way, we're not done yet. We still have one more point. But we're going to sing, turn your eyes. Make this a prayer today that the Lord would help us to fix our eyes on him. Let's sing together. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for in his wonderful face. And the things on earth will grow. Strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for in his wonderful face and the things. In the light of his glory and grace. Fija tus ojos. Fija tus ojos en Cristo. Yan lleno de gracia y amor. Y lo te in valor será en la luz del glorioso Señor una vez más 
Fija tus ojos en Cristo, tan lleno de gracia y amor, y no te rendas sin valor, será a la luz de Rochelle, thank you. It's beautiful. So beautiful. You sounded so beautiful. But the beautiful part about this is that it's true. The things of this world can grow strangely dim, even when it doesn't make sense, even when they should feel central, when they should be a big deal. They can become peripheral. We can fix our eyes on Christ. Amen? He's our primary relationship. The rest can become peripheral. And thirdly and finally, it's not about perfection. It's about progress. Some of you are hearing me talk about a Christ-centered life. And if I said to you outside these doors, do you live a Christ-centered life? You would say, yes, no, uh, I don't know. Um, I'm trying, right? Very few of you would say, yeah, absolutely. Because it can be a very daunting concept. Christ is the center. He's the primary. He's everything. I got to fix my eyes. It's a lot sometimes. So here's what we're going to talk about lastly, because it's so important that being Christ-centered is not about how good you are or how good I am. Being Christ-centered is about how good Jesus is. It's about how good Jesus is. He has never expected perfection of us. That's why he became the perfect sacrifice, because we couldn't be on our own. He became the perfect sacrifice so that we could make progress and become more like him. So we could be right with God by a means not of our own. Praise Jesus for that. Philippians 3.12 says, Paul says, not that I've already obtained this, not that I've already arrived at my goal. He's saying, I'm not perfect. I've not arrived yet, but I press on. I press on. I keep making progress. I press toward the goal to win the prize. He's saying, I'm not perfect yet. I'm not going to be until I see Jesus face to face, but I'm going to win this prize. I am in this to win this. And what is the prize? Who is the prize? Jesus. He is the prize. Philippians chapter 1, 6, same letter. Paul says, I am confident of this, that he, Christ, who began a good work, will carry it on to completion. You see, church, we're on this continuum. Each one of us are on this continuum. We start here, we're dead in our sin. Then we're saved by grace, hallelujah. Then we're in this process of sanctification, becoming more like Christ. And eventually we will experience glorification. What does that mean? Let's practice that again. We were dead in our sin. Then we were saved by grace. We are in a process of sanctification and one day we will be glorified. The author and perfecter of our faith will glorify us by him and in him. Amen? That's going to be one fine day. <laughs> I get a little too excited about that day sometimes. But we're not there yet. We are in the process of sanctification. Not perfection. Sanctification. Making progress. Becoming more like Christ. These holidays were awesome. We had a great time with friends and food and family. But about a week in or maybe two weeks into December, I was off. I, have anybody? <laughs> when you're just like, I'm off. You know, I was off. And, and I thought it's because of the change of schedule, because schedule changes really throw me. Anybody? Yeah, thank you for your honesty. <laughs> but, um, but it was more than that, and I couldn't figure it out. And I, and I, I started to analyze it, and it hit me. It's you. It's you. I'm off because we're off. And I realized I had not spent time in God's word for days. I hadn't spent time in focused prayer for days. You can look at me real holy like, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When you're just like, that Bible's still sitting there, but you haven't opened it in a minute. Okay? And some of you are saying, yeah, a week? Ha! Huh. Right? Okay. Saying. 
I literally was like, Lord, it's you. We're off. I'm doing all these things, but there's no wind behind it. Like I'm, I'm, I'm doing all the right things, but, but I'm depleted of strength and energy and joy. What's going on? It's you. So you come back into his presence, come back into his word. And this is one of my favorite things about Jesus is that he doesn't say to you, how dare you ignore me? No, no. When you come back into his presence, when you keep making progress, when you put yourself back in his word, he says, I've missed you. (laughs) And that's the word that he's speaking to many of you today. You've not been in his presence. You're not striving for progress because you know you can't be perfect. And his word to you today would be, I miss you, come home. He's missed you. Our God is not far off. He is not distant. Christ is not angry or offended or insecure. No, that's not who Jesus is. Jesus is the anointed one. He is the Messiah. Jesus is the victorious one. He is the son of man. He is the son of God. He is the lamb of God. He is the lion of Judah. He is Emmanuel, the God that is with us. He is wonderful counselor. He is mighty God. He is everlasting father. He is prince of peace. Jesus is the word made flesh. He's the light of the world. Jesus is the way. He's the truth. He's the life. Jesus is the bread. He's the gate. He's the vine. Jesus is the chief shepherd. Jesus is the master builder. Jesus is both high priest and perfect sacrifice. Jesus is the cornerstone. He is the second Adam. He is the greater Moses. He is the deliverer. He is the redeemer. He is the savior of the world. Jesus is a friend of sinners. He is a master, prophet, teacher, healer the Alpha and the Omega, the living water. He is the bridegroom and he is our soon returning king. Jesus is the bright and morning star and he is the image of the invisible God. And he is the center of our lives. He is the center of his church and he is the center of heaven itself. And when God the Father makes the call, Jesus will return for his church and Jesus will set up a new heaven and a new earth and of his kingdom, there will be no end. That's who our Jesus is. So we come before you right now, King, and we acknowledge that you are our King. We acknowledge that you are all of these things and so much more. You are our soon returning King. We worship you. I pray that you would give us the strength, the ability, the grace to be our primary relationship. Would you forgive us of being distracted or disturbed or whatever it is? Would you allow us to make everything else peripheral as you are the center? Father, I pray that you would help us to keep making progress, to keep becoming more like you until the day we see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, 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 amen. To Christ be the glory. Amen, amen. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna spend a moment in reflection and we're gonna ask the Holy Spirit, is there something I've been making central that needs to become peripheral? Is there something I've been focusing on that you want to invite to put to the side and fix my eyes back on you? So let's pray. And then John will come up.